58. For our learning. Romans 15, 1 to 7. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbours for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, but, as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another, according to Christ Jesus, that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore, receive ye one another, as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Romans chapter 15, verses 1 to 7. Paul's concern, as we have seen, is with the weak and the strong in the church and their conflict. It must be remembered that these terms are relative. In verse 1, Paul infers this with his reference, We then that are strong. Both sides no doubt believed that they were the strong ones. In our day, in those churches where there are disagreements over smoking and drinking, for example, both sides often see themselves as the strong, that is, as more holy. From this fact arose the problem and the conflict. The strong often feel that it is their calling and duty to govern the weak. As a result, both sides seek to govern each other. Paul puts the matter on a different footing. Our duty as the strong is to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. We prove our strength by being forbearing and thoughtful. Paul, in effect, has redefined the strong as those who bear the infirmities of the weak rather than pleasing themselves. This means that both sides of the controversy over meats, days and wine can demonstrate strength in a very simple way. Paul identifies himself with such strength by saying, We that are strong, so that, if any would be with Paul, they too would show like strength. In a similar context, 1 Corinthians 10, 31-33, Paul tells us what strength in such matters is. Whether, therefore, ye eat, or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God, Give none offence, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the Church of God. Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. The word infirmities is in the Greek anasthenomata, anasthenoma, and this is the only usage of the Greek word in the New Testament, although another form, Anasthenia is used, meaning a lack of strength. By using this word, Paul in effect says that to go after the weak is a form of bullying and is hardly commendable. If we are noble, we should behave nobly. If we are strong, we do not behave in a cowardly and contemptible manner. The truly strong are protective and helpful to the weak, not hostile contemptuous, critical, or lordly towards them. Hence, verse 2. Let every one of us please his neighbour for his good to edification. In verse 1, Paul asks us to bear the infirmities of the weak. Bear is bastazain, bastazo, to support. Now he adds that we should please our neighbour for his good to edification, that is, to build him up into a stronger person. Paul tells both sides that there are more important things at stake than their jots and tittles. The community of Christ, its growth and peace are the key fact. We are to please our neighbour, 
for his good and edification. However, not to flatter him nor to seek peace at any price. Calvin noted this fact clearly. There are here two things laid down, that we are not to be content with our own judgment, nor acquiesce in our own desires, but ought to strive and labour at all times to please our brethren, and then that, in endeavouring to accommodate ourselves to our brethren, we ought to have regard to God, so that our objects may be their edification, for the greater parts cannot be pleased except you indulge their humour, so that if you wish to be in favour with most men, their salvation must not be so much regarded, but their folly must be flattered, nor must you look to what is expedient, but to what they seek to their own ruin. You must not then strive to please those to whom nothing is pleasing but evil. There is a too common habit to take single sentences of Scripture, such as, Judge not, God is love, and the like, and to use them to exclude much else in Scripture. Those who indulge in such usage are self-condemned by their refusal to hear any more of God's Word than what is useful for their purposes. These words of Paul have been misused in this way. Our example in such strength as Paul speaks of is Christ himself. Verse 3. Calvin, again, is to the point here. For even Christ pleased not himself, etc. Since it is not right that a servant should refuse what his Lord has himself undertaken, it would be very strange in us to wish an exemption from the duty of bearing the infirmities of others, to which Christ, in whom we glory as our Lord and King, submitted himself, for he, having no regard for himself, gave up himself wholly to this service. In this verse, Paul quotes the Septuagint version of Psalm 69.9. The psalm describes the sufferings of a righteous man. Verse 4 of the psalm is quoted in John 15.25. Part of verse 9 is quoted in John 2 verse 17. The rest of verse 9 is cited in this verse by Paul. Verse 12 is echoed in Matthew 27, 27 to 30. Verse 21 is cited in Matthew chapter 27, verse 34, and John 19, 29, verses 22 and 23 appear in Romans 11, 9. And verse 25 in Acts 1, verse 20. Christ and the apostles saw an inseparable unity between the Old and New Testaments, and they saw Christ as a federal head of all the suffering saints of history, so that none are above or unique in their sufferings and troubles. Cranfield noted that many have found it surprising that Paul here quotes the psalm instead of citing examples from Christ's life. But Paul, Cranfield pointed out, is calling for the recognition that Jesus Christ is the true meaning and substance of the law and the prophets. Compare, for example, 1, 2, 3, verse 21, chapter 9, verse 30, to chapter 10, verse 8. John Knox saw in this a reference to Christ's divine pre-existence, which power and glory he was willing to set aside for our sakes, Compare 2 Corinthians 8 9, Philippians 2 6 and 8. Thus, verse 3 tells us much with respect to the whole of Scripture. Christ is the new or last Adam, 1 Corinthians 15 45 50, the head of the new humanity and the king of the new creation. He is, however, at the same time, both a new creation by his virgin birth. Luke chapter 1, verse 1 to chapter 2, verse 20, Matthew 1, verses 18 to 25, and yet also connected to the old humanity of Adam, Luke 3, verses 23 to 38. He is then the saviour of all saints of both the worlds before his coming and after, and he incarnates himself to sum up, express, and redeem them and all their sufferings and experiences. 
Hence, Paul can declare that all things work together for good to the call of God. Romans 8, 28. The fact of the Incarnation necessitates the kind of interpretation Paul gives us. Paul stresses this fact in verse 4. The Scriptures not only give us God's law for our learning, but also the hand of God in all events. Seeing Christ in David's sufferings and in the griefs of many nameless saints, Hebrews 11, verses 32 to 40, we are to have hope patience and comfort. Even as Christ is identified by his incarnation with all these saints who cry out, as in Psalm 69, so too he is one with us. We are never alone, nor are we finally defeated. We cannot undermine the present validity of the Old Testament without weakening our strength, hope and patience The word translated as learning is didaskalion, meaning teaching or instruction, so that there is nothing abstract about what we are to learn. This verse applies to the whole of the Old Testament and, by implication, the New. Moreover, the meaning of these verses cannot be reduced to a purely personal and pietistic level. The experiences of the prophets and kings in the civil sphere are as fully intended for our teaching and guidance as anything else. In verses 5 and 6, we have Paul's prayer for his readers. He tells us that God is the God of patience and consolation. A remarkable description. God's design and restraint in his work of creation and the government thereof require such a description. His long-suffering with us underscores it, and Paul reminds us thereby that we, who require so much enduring patience from God, should be patient and like-minded towards one another. Unity and harmony of worship will be the result of unity of life. They will best glorify God by a holy peace with one another. Verse 7 both sums up the foregoing and introduces what follows. Wherefore, receive ye one another, as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Receive is proslambesete, and in reference to Christ is proslabato. It can mean welcome. Luther translated the sentence thus. Welcome one another, therefore, as Christ has welcomed you, for the glory of God. This conveys a fact of grace more clearly, grace from Christ and therefore grace through us. This is a command to both sides. Both must manifest grace. In Romans 5, 8, Paul says, But God commendeth his love toward us, in that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Given this fact, we dare not be Pharisees. Both sides in Rome regarded themselves as the strong. Paul was ready to see one of them as weak. The heart of his argument is that the church belongs to neither and they have no right to exclude one another. The church is Christ's, not theirs, and Christ has redeemed both sides and is the sole Lord and judge of both. The church is always wider and greater than we can know. When Elijah felt that he alone remained in his day, the Lord reminded him that he had seven thousand in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which has not kissed him. 1 Kings 19.18 These men were invisible to Elijah, and he may have felt them to be worthless, but God knew them to be instruments of his power in his time and place. Very shortly, he added the young Elisha to Elijah's work and soon a company of young men. The weak and the strong in Rome saw each other on a limited scale on one to three issues, meat, drink and days. In terms of this, each saw the other as weak and, plainly, one side was right. 
There was, however, more to each than those issues. Both could not be right on these issues, but, in a variety of ways, each had other strengths and weaknesses. Moreover, because the whole of Scripture manifests God's eternal counsel and plan, so too do the whole of our lives. God gives us his word by revelation, but the application of the meaning of that revelation is hammered out in the griefs, problems and burdens of life. As sinners, we are slow learners, and it sometimes takes the community of Christ our King centuries to learn some very simple facts. The humanistic revolutionists take a shortcut to learning by means of power. The seizure of power has as its goal to speed up history and growth. In reality, it retards or destroys it because it denies the fact of man's fall. It substitutes the planning of an elite for the predestination of God. And the result is disaster. 